This video is sponsored by Ridge Wallet. Zoe is the most enchanting arc of One Piece I've read through and I've enjoyed my time reading this arc more than practically every single setup arc in the series. I'm serious, it's immersive, captivating, thrilling, and it succeeds in establishing situations and lore that have made me even more interested in and excited for what's to come in this story. I get the feeling that Zoe might not be held in super high standing amidst the rest of the One Piece catalog, specifically because I've heard no one talk about this 22 chapter long prologue to this massive oncoming section of the story. Curiously titled, The Four Emperor's Saga. I honestly can't wait to get into why I love this arc to a borderline unreasonable extent. So without further ado, I'm Tony Not Mark, and these are my first impressions of, thoughts on, and review for the magical, the mysterious, and the magnificent Zo Arc. So right off the bat, the most enjoyable aspects from this arc come from how it's structured. Expertly interweaved with the prior Dressrosa arc, the events of which inform the beginning and consequences of this one. We are tied to the perspective of the fractured Straw Hat Pirates under Luffy, whom, after defeating and handing over Doflamingo to the Navy, is now in search of his friends on the island of Zoe after they attempted to escape from Big Mom. The stakes, tensions, and questions this story establishes for its readers to come to grips with, right from the get-go, are palpable and massively captivating. This feels like a genuine and true continuation of the story, helped inextricably by the fact so much of what has made the arc feel visceral was set up in the arc prior, which, while relatively rudimentary compared to how advanced some of the steps he's taken in the story so far have been, the fact remains that simple and basic additions to the story like this help in a multitude of ways to not only help the pacing of the prior arc by cutting down, focusing the cash you need to occupy, but it also encourages the very prior arc in Dressrosa to carry a lot of the heavy lifting for this one. By establishing tension and a goal for us to follow. And this is super simple stuff in principle, but when you're dealing with the climax of the biggest arc in a long time, it's reassuring to know that Oda is always thinking about the future no matter how complicated the current circumstances are, which is something I cannot say about other properties that Toei represent like Dragon Ball Super, which while I did enjoy aspects of it to a huge extent, really had very little linking its story arcs together, causing them to feel like isolated standalone narrative instances instead of connecting ones as part of a greater story like one Piece effectively accomplishes time and time again. In any case, this is what I loved about the setup for Zoe as an arc. But how did I enjoy the arc itself? It's a delicious arc that left me hungry for so much more, which is exactly what I want from every arc I read through. It's exciting, concise, and does not overstay its welcome like others may or may not have in the past. And this arc I would identify as being easily broken up into three separate components that ultimately serve to make this story as interesting and well-paced as it was. So let's go through each section and try to identify where its strengths lie and how it implemented them in such an effective way. Kicking things off with part one, the unknown and the mysterious. Occupying the contents of this very first section of the story is a distinct feeling of mystery and caution. Already, as I mentioned a moment ago, it's been established what the goal of the Straw Hats currently is, and that's to regroup before making their next move. However, we are only at this point made aware of the circumstances surrounding Luffy's group on their way to rendezvous with the rest of his crew. And due to One Piece being the story of Luffy, this arc offers a unique circumstance wherein we know exactly the same info Luffy does. And because he doesn't know where the rest of them are, nor what sort of fate have befallen them, like, did they make it to the island of Zoe? Did they get captured by Big Mom? Or did something else happen to them that we aren't aware of yet? These are all questions swirling around in Luffy's mind, and by extension, us, linking us to the story in a very visceral way, assessing the possible outcomes as the story presses forward. And as this story highlighted during the initial voyage to Zoe, it reinforces what we are voyaging for, the missing Straw Hats, with Nami not being there to navigate, leading to various navigation tribulations, and with Sanji gone, Luffy tries his hand and fails at whipping up some grub for his team. These are small inclusions in the story, but just like Amazon Lily demonstrated Luffy lacking in certain areas his friends helped him with, so too does this arc demonstrate the struggles they face when they aren't all united, proving in addition to the emotional reasoning we have to find a regroup with the rest of them, they add a utilitarian one. They need each other to survive. In addition to those reinforcements of the established themes in this arc, we're also greeted by some really interesting fallout and points of view from various characters. Dragon expresses that he wants to gather all of the revolutionary leaders and seems to show more interest in Robin than his own son, which I call BS on seeing as he saw to his son's safety in Logetown. Don't think I forgot about that, Mr. 
I can control the weather or something vaguely like that. But that's not what's curious about this scene, in fact. It's the instance that Blackbeard seems to have the location of this revolutionary base, targeting it as something in need of overthrowing. Which I'm exceedingly excited for, considering I've been waiting for Dragon to do something for ages. He's shown in Logetown, we see a glimpse of his picture in Alabasta, and really he's peppered throughout this tale, but never ever the focus. So I'm interested to see where this plotline goes. And finally, before I move on, it's briefly mentioned that there exists this big individual, while being encouraged by his mother, who claims to be the supposed son of Whitebeard. So yeah, don't know what to make of that. These side stories are really the only instances in this arc that draw our attention away from the main plot, which I'm honestly thrilled about because this happens when they discover and arrive at Zoe. And man, was I not prepared for what I saw. This reveal, with it being a combination of both awe and astonishment, created within me a feeling I can honestly say I not for a second anticipated or saw coming. For me, this is the single greatest reveal spectacle of the entire series, bar none. And I mean that. The surge of questions, curiosity, and the notion that we're gonna climb that thing was needless to say enough to spur on my desire to explore this world and uncover its secrets that bit more. We were looking for an island called Zoe, and what we discovered was a land mass carried in the back of the single largest creature ever shown to us in this series. A 1,000 year old elephant as it marches dead-eyed across its world. Where's it going? Why is it walking? How did Zoe get on top of this elephant? What is on top of this elephant? All these questions swirled aggressively in my head, creating a beautiful cocktail of curiosity and intrigue. Needless to say, I adored how this story was structured, but now I adore how it's framed. But the first question is, how in the hell are they going to climb this thing? Well, a certain Samurai with an incredibly helpful power has a proposal. This was one of the single strangest but best gag sequences that I've probably ever experienced in One Piece. I have no idea how it's structured in the anime, but in the manga, the journey this little cartoon dragon character goes on to get the crew to the top of this massive elephant is framed in a very short period of time as an inspirational journey that's even structured like its very own hero's journey. It's so over the top and funny. He accepts the call to action. He struggles, endures loss even, pushes through for the sake of the other and proves himself wrong at the end, rising to the occasion in summiting the massive hind leg of this elephant before disappearing entirely. It's so ridiculous and I love Oda for creating something so wacky to lighten the mood before we discover even more mystery on this island. What's more is that at this point in the story, I had a theory brewing which proved to be wrong, but I'll tell it anyway. So the Straw Hats, in addition to looking for the rest of the crew here, came to this island in the first place to retrieve the third and final part of the samurai group, a ninja called Raizo. Now, no description is given about this character, and when the two samurai fall off the elephant, they do so after a monkey fell from the island towards them. For the longest time, I was convinced that this little monkey guy could have been the ninja Raizo, but it wasn't. It was uh, just a monkey. What an appalling prediction. Everything about this journey feels like an adventure in its purest form, the likes of which I haven't felt since the group's excursion into the lands of Skypia. And to be clear, I think this works better because we already have the driving motivation alongside the exploration. Zoe is lush and gorgeous, with the panels in the manga demonstrating this fact at every available opportunity. But curiously, once Luffy races off on his own in excitement, Robin remarks that there are clear signs of a struggle Citing that whomever lived here, their civilization looks as though it came to an abrupt end two weeks ago. And I just love Robin's deductive reasoning in this section, looking around at all the architecture, inferring from its construction that this was man-made and that they lived here for a very long time. Made abundantly true when the elephant itself spouts water onto its back, which in turn gives life to the entire area, but also causes them significant stress because they weren't really anticipating that. It's small inclusions like this that honestly give believability to the world of so of course it needs water to survive. And of course the elephant will always need to cool itself off. And it's those admittedly brief moments of detail that add so much to this world. And once we discover the inhabitants of this island, we learn that any and every anthropomorphic creature we've ever met in the show more than likely originated from this small land on the back of this elephant. That includes the bear from Law's crew. Again, like any good addition to this sprawling story, it enriches the prior stories with extra insight and information. In addition to that, we also meet Carrot. 
And it's this introduction guided by this dog person called Wanda who's supposedly wearing Nami's clothes. She leads Luffy to and eventually the rest of the Straw Hats to their base of operations within this world where they regroup with Nami, Chopper and Brooke. But one person is curiously missing, Sanji. So where is he? And this instance, when the crew finally meet up with and reconvene with each other, is where the first section of the story ends. And admittedly, at this point, I had a ton of questions, but thankfully, the next section did exactly what I wanted it to do. It went back in time and showed us what transpired right after we left off with the crew as they were being pursued by Big Mom's ship, during Dress Rosa. I was massively excited to say the least, specifically because I thought the sequence called for a moment like this, but also because I was really interested to see how Oda would tell a sort of story like this. So let's check out how this story came together and filled in the holes in the plot. Section two, filling in the timeline. From this point in the story, there will be nothing but revelation after revelation, bringing us all up to speed with the events that have transpired since we last saw Sanji's group 11 days ago in the story. Interestingly, they actually escaped the clutches of Big Mom's ship without much effort with Caesar in tow also. Which reminds me, Sanji and Caesar are gone. And with it only taking an extra day after they do lose Big Mom's ship to arrive at the base of this enormous elephant carrying Zo. Now, what's interesting about this whole encounter to follow is not only the curious characters and circumstances they uncover, but more so the fact that this timeline conflicts with Robin's remark earlier about the city coming into conflict over two weeks prior. And naturally, Nami's story corroborates this fact. Something happened before even Sanji's group arrived. And all the while this tale is being recanted by Nami, in the back of our minds we have the single piece of information we are waiting to learn about, and that's Sanji's disappearance. Now, naturally there are a host of other questions the gang are looking to learn, and slowly over the course of this explanation from Nami, we learn the harsh and uncomfortable fate that befell the poor civilization almost three weeks prior at the hands of one of Kaido's main men, Master Jack. The design of this person is massively intimidating and with a bounty of <clears throat> 1 billion berries, it really puts into perspective the magnitude of a threat this individual boasts. And despite the forces of the daytime and nighttime on this island not cooperating, they do provide a decent struggle against this particular foe. But perhaps the most interesting part is the reason this Master Jack of Kaido's empire has chosen to ransack the island in the first place. They are looking for Raizo from Wano. Again, I'm completely unaware of how this particular grouping of scenes plays out in the anime, but in the manga, the visuals depict a truly harrowing circumstance after befalling the likes of the two leaders, Duke Dogstorm and Cat Viper, alongside their many people, declaring and pleading with their torturers that they do not know of nor have they ever harbored any such individual. In the face of this, maybe because they don't believe them or maybe because they just like it, the forces of Master Jack insist on dragging the poor inhabitants of this country kicking and screaming to near death. It's horrific. We're also introduced to a bunch of other characters working under Master Jack, including, but not limited to, a certain individual called Sheep's Head. He's not a very nice guy. After many days of this torture, out of seemingly nowhere, Master Jack was called away on an urgent need, leaving just the skeleton crew behind to finish them off. And this is where our straw hat Sanji, Nami, Brook, Chopper, and Momonosuke arrive with Caesar in tow. Again, every piece of information drip fed throughout this story helps us add context to different visuals we were shown earlier in the arc when Luffy and them arrived. We've seen the ruined structures, we've seen the racks where people were left to die on, we've seen every wound this damaged civilization has endured, and now we have an appropriate context for everything. And what's more is that the events that took place in the last arc totally informed the events of this one, down to a T, and I absolutely adore that. It might not seem like a huge issue when thrown out quickly, but something One Piece has usually been really good at is avoiding convenience when it comes to the events the characters participate in. For me, the sign of a weaker writer or weak story structure is one that has their characters arrive at a location where, as luck would have it, something out of the ordinary for that particular village or town is happening. Or maybe a random chance event lures them in. A good example of this plot orientation in action can be observed in series that typically adopt the monster of the week type form 
format. They might have a loose overarching plot, but it's by no means the focus of every given episode. In these, characters encounter fantastical things within each place they visit, and this sort of causes the characters to feel more like passive participants in the world, while other more active or interesting ones inform the events that unfold. Admittedly, this is a preference I have, and there's nothing wrong with liking that format, but I love characters that are active within their own story. I love individuals that once they enter a room become the focus because they are causing the interesting things to happen. They deserve this story to be told about them. This is why Vegeta during the Saiyan and Namek arcs was so interesting and why I adore Luffy. How many times have I described a scene where Luffy pretty much just wings it or decides to randomly go on the offense? He doesn't wait for the story to happen to him. Luffy happens to the story. And as consistent as ever, Luffy happens to this island too. You see, once he defeated Doflamingo, Kaido suddenly became aware of it. And because he had that skin in the game, needing Doflamingo, he ordered Master Jack, someone he could trust, to leave whatever he was doing on Zo and pursue to free Doflamingo from his naval escort. The events of Dressrosa not only set up this arc, but this arc, simply put, couldn't have existed without it. It is, in the purest sense, inextricably linked with the events of Dressrosa, with, as I mentioned, its setup being informed by it, and quite literally all of what makes this arc interesting in a narrative sense spawns from that arc also. The mystery and the stakes would not even remotely be at the same ballpark level had it not been for the last installment. And because of this upheaval and leaving on behalf of Master Jack, once the first group of Straw Hats did arrive, they were able to liberate the people of Zoe from their torturers in addition to providing the necessary aid. And because they provided aid, when Luffy arrived with his crew, they were treated like heroes. This informs that, and that informs this. Everything is connected, everything makes sense, and now we have delicious context for it all. I love this arc, everything just connects perfectly. And the simple addition of it shows the far-reaching implications of the actions the crew are taking these days. No longer confined to the East Blue or the naval-dominated section of the Grand Line, we are in the new world now. And when you interfere with the business of an Emperor of the Sea, the effects on the wider world can be felt almost immediately. Case in point, Zo. In addition to that, we got some nice teamwork during these flashbacks as Sanji takes out the brutes, but still, the weapons used to win this struggle over the minks of Zo were gas-based and creations of Caesar himself. So good thing he's there and just sucks up everything. However, still, even with all the context, we are still missing crucial information concerning the whereabouts of Sanji. And this scene covers just that. <laughs> This is the scene that pretty much dictates and will inform the series of events that'll no doubt unfold within the next coming arcs and perhaps even further beyond. I have no idea if the effects are still being felt today of this scene, but only time will tell. Regardless and irrespective of future complications, this scene in this arc creates a powerful moment for Sanji, which I'm honestly happy about. This video is brought to you by Ridge.com slash TNM. Most people are still using wallets designed in the 1990s and in this modern landscape, it's seriously outdated. And I should know, I've been using the same wallet since I was 15 years old and that means I've been using some outdated wallet for the last 14 years of my life. In the same way phones have gotten more practical and compact over the last few decades, so too have wallets and it's honestly made a massive difference to my pockets. Personally, I hate having cumbersome items in there and this totally fits my new lifestyle. It holds up to 12 separate cards, plus room for cash, and there's over 30 different colors and styles, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium to choose from. And if that wasn't enough to win you over yet, check out their 30,000 five-star reviews. The durable nature of each of these wallets comes with a lifetime warranty, so, in theory, you could buy this one wallet and carry it for life. And the Ridge team have told me that they're so confident that you like it that they'll actually let you test drive it for 45 days. That means you can send it back for a full refund if it's not up to your own standards. Right now, there's a special offer going where you can get 10% off with free worldwide shipping and returns. And you can get all of this by going to ridge.com slash TNA and using the coupon code TNM. Link is in the description. How about a cup of tea for a change? I've got peppermint, spearmint, pickle tea, pepper tea, and my favorite, a pack of Peter Piper pickle pepper tea. As it happens, two days prior to Luffy and the gang showing up on Zoe, Big Mom's forces appeared on the island. 
They announced that they are there for two reasons, but interestingly, the lion mink in their company by the name of Pecoms, one of the leaders in this group, declares his gratitude towards them for saving his homeland from the rampaging forces of Kaido, citing that they will only take Caesar and not anything regarding their second mission. And that's when this happens. This is where the direct conflict within the series of flashbacks takes root. Capone Beji, another one of the in-command personnel and part of the worst generation, much the same as Law and Luffy, takes the initiative by shooting Pecoms for his weak and overly sentimental approach, getting in the way of why they were there in the first place. They are there for two reasons. The first is to retrieve Caesar, which none of the Straw Hats have any protest about, but the second, he'll tell them once they step inside his body. Wielding the power of the Castle Castle Fruit, a portal opens into the ranks of the Internal Fortress and the group nervously sit around a table. This is when the news is finally revealed and their second objective is laid to bear. I love this scene. Within it we learn a tremendous amount regarding Sanji's upbringing and backstory in just a few illuminating pieces of information. We learn that he's part of an important crime family called the Vinsmokes, of which he's the third son. Interestingly, I always figured he was an orphan, given the circumstances surrounding his introduction to the series with Zeph and his backstory therein. So, to hear that his immediate family, his nuclear family, are not only important but also alive, is something I'm not even sure I know how to reconcile yet. Immediately I'm filled with surface level suspicions like, there must have been a good reason for him to leave. Someone must have helped him leave, I mean, he was very young child at the time, and during this arc a specific emphasis is drawn on the distance he must have travelled to get to the East Blue from where he was in the North. Was it someone in the Navy? How did they cross the Red Line? I have so many questions circulating in my head surrounding this very small plot thread that I'm dizzy from thinking about it. Despite this dizzying news, however, Sanji is being beckoned for one specific reason, to marry the 35th daughter of Big Mom, going by the name of Pudding. I have no idea again what to make of this news or what sort of far-reaching implications might stem from this, but all I do know is that Sanji demanded that his friends be freed and in return he would go to the tea party being held by Big Mom. Sanji writes a letter before taking his leave, promising to return. Having received such important news regarding the fate of one of the original four Straw Hats, this story once again pulls the rug out from beneath my feet. <laughs> After the samurai reveal themselves to be in allegiance with the rest of the Ming civilization, this insane piece of information is revealed. Tying up the end of this section in a surprising but welcome bow is the reveal of Raizo, the samurai they had initially arranged to go to Zo to retrieve in the first place. It's revealed that despite Raizo actually being harboured on the island of Zo, the inhabitants not for a second entertained the idea of ever selling him out to their torturers, which on its own is badass but they also tied him up and did everything in their power to make sure that he was none the wiser of their plight. It's honestly quite sad and adds a lot of respect to the minks that live here, specifically when Raizo talks about how they brought him food and took care of him despite their clearly worsening conditions as the days progressed. It's a harrowing tale and not to mention makes a great little swerve when also informing us of the alliance the country has with Wano. And with that, that brings us to the third and final part of this arc and that is Reveals and Conflict. This is the section where Oda drops a much welcomed and hefty exposition dump. I say welcomed because of a single piece of information Wanda mentions towards the beginning of this arc, and that's that this civilization has been atop this elephant for a thousand years, which meant that it was perfectly within reason for me to infer from that that this civilization might have something to do with the Void Century. And would you look at what the ninja is tied to? It's a poneglyph, but not just a regular run-of-the-mill poneglyph, it's a redstone poneglyph, and these things are bloody important. This is the first sign of an end goal or a means with which to get the location for an end goal I have seen in the series. 
You see, this special red potoglyph thing is part of a four-piece set. Each one points to a specific location in the world, and if you plot all the locations gathered by all of these on a map and intersect the coordinates, you get the location of Raftel. The reason why Raftel is important is because it was only traveled to by the former King of the Pirates, and may also be the location of the fabled One Piece treasure, so it's sort of a big deal. Not just because it presents a clear and easily understandable goal for us to follow, but it also informs the rest of the story from here on out because once the situation with Sanji gets addressed, they will have to try to locate and decipher the locations of all of these redstone poneglyphs. Which seems straightforward until you come to understand that two of these are in the possession of Big Mom and Kaido respectively. Interestingly, however, all the Straw Hats technically need to do is to find the locations pointed to on these maps. Which sort of opens us up to lies in the sea. I mean, what if Luffy trusted someone who told them that the Poneglyph was pointing to a specific location, only to find out that it was a lie? That would totally throw off the location of Raftel and would make for some serious tension between two characters. And that's just one way this story could go with this particular line of thinking. And if you think this particular revelation is the only thing mentioned in this section, then buckle up. Momonosuke isn't the son of Kinemon, or any other samurai in the party for that matter. He is in fact a noble heir by the name of which explains his bratty attitude, further recontextualizing prior events. But what's more is that I learned the people of Wano 800 years ago created the Poneglyphs. Which is of course curious or obvious timing depending on your definition, considering that that was when the Void Century occurred. However, more recently, Kaido and his pirates are after invading Wano and due to their king not cooperating, rating they killed him. We're talking about a guy who apparently sailed with Gold D. Roger to Raftel, by the way. This is a huge deal. Apparently, his dying wish was to open one of those borders to the rest of the world, so I'm sure that will play as a motivation in the future. But needless to say, this arc is amazing. So now not only have we a goal for the next arc, which is to suss out the situation with Sanji and to get him out of there, not only have we a goal after that in dealing with the oppressive shoguns of Wano and liberating the country from Kaido, but we also have a separate over arcing B or C plot where the Straw Hats need to partake in the single most important scavenger hunt ever concocted. It's bonkers and this arc is still not done. Despite this being short-lived and not really focused on action at all with the main cast, it serves to bring yet again another vital piece of information to the forefront of my mind. Master Jack attempts to kill the elephant that's carrying Zoe, and what's more is that he almost succeeds in dealing some serious damage to the poor creature too. But thankfully, this happens. George, stop! Bellowing through the skulls of Luffy and Momo is the voice of the giant elephant. And this situation is almost the exact same as the one which occurred during the Fishman Island arc with the princess there. Luffy can hear it, but Momo can hear it and communicate to it, ordering it to take out Master Jack in one of the most intimidating panels when the elephant turns to face its attackers. <laughs> Something I thought worth mentioning here is a subtle difference between the Neptunians and this massive elephant that I've noticed. The Neptunians seem to have their own agency and this elephant needed the order from Momo. To me, that's super interesting, but I'm not exactly even sure why yet. And that's really what this whole arc has been. It's ridiculously fascinating. Whether it be the pursuit of Kaido's men to hunt down Marco, which I never touched on by the way, but will definitely in a later part because I'm sure it will come up later. Carrot with all of her furry cuteness opting to tag along with Luffy in his covert mission to Whole Cake Island alongside Nami, Chopper, Brooke, and Pedro to save Sanji, or the series of panels dedicated to showing all the royal families around the world readying themselves, including Princess Vivi, by the way, for the reverie. Oh, and, uh, Master Jack is a fishman? What? And I didn't even mention the base where the revolutionaries and dragon work out of has been completely toasted by Blackbeard. Long story short, so much is happening in this story. I am, as I've mentioned countless times throughout the duration of this video, a massive fan of the structure implemented. The opening establishes and invokes a visceral sense of mystery. The middle deals with exploring and uncovering the secrets introduced in that opening. And the final part extrapolates new and fantastical ways with which to view the world with far reaching implications for the story moving forward. 
To say that I enjoyed this would be an understatement of the highest order. In my opinion, this arc achieves a level of proficiency and efficiency all within a sufficient and succinct amount of time. It's tightly paced, it's exciting, it's exceptionally well written, it's got some shocking visuals and even some of the best and most inventive comedy I've seen in this series. The only setback I could see this arc having for some people out there is the level to which it abstains from the typical fight scenes. Now, there are scuffles and fights to be had in this arc, just not with everyone, Luffy being among those that don't really take part in action during this section. However, that didn't bother me even in the slightest. We had tons of fighting during Dressrosa. It was time for a break in my opinion, and Zo was the perfect continuation. While not reaching the heights of the Sabaudi Archipelago arc in terms of tension and action, I think it far exceeds it in practically every other metric, making this for me a contender as one of, if not the best setup arc in the entire One Piece series. And I have no idea if that's a controversial take, but there it is. Next week, once again, in an effort to address as many things as I possibly can and to not disappoint you guys, I'll be covering the first half of Whole Cake Island. But that'll do it for this video. I'll see you all next week on Whole Cake Island. I've been Totally Not Mark, and thank you all so much for watching.